So we've got, uh, we've left a good bit of time here for questions, and so I want you to think about those. I, I heard something that I want you to comment on again, any of you here, uh, data. You know, we talk about data, and if I go to an insurance company and say, well, what's the deal with data? They, oh, it's available. We give it to any company that asks for it. So something must have been, that must not be exactly right, because Barbara, you all actually went to the cost of, you know, paying your own claims so that you could have your data and you gave us some very good examples with the diabetes program and other things where you you mine that data and determine what programs you needed. So the other two of you, how, is, how easy is it for you to get actionable data in a timely manner on your health claims and, and all of the other integrated health concerns? Uh, you I can tell you from a standpoint at Southwire, you would think having 7,500 employees, which is about over 14,000 belly buttons, as I affectionately call them. Um, <laughs> when it comes to getting my data, it is like pulling teeth um, to try to negotiate with a healthcare system. Uh, we're with Anthem, which is you know the big gorilla. Um, they give you good deals on the the, the cost but it's a very old and not a very user-friendly system when you want to know something immediately or in real time. But what we've been able to do is with our on-site medical center, we're actually piloting um, with all, one of many um, sites, um, EPIC, which is a EMR, electronic medical record. But it's not just a record your doctor uses, it actually has a portal where the employee can interact. And it has telemedicine. So that is becoming, or video, let's just call it that, you start calling things telemedicine, then it becomes a legal issue, and legislatively we have to understand all those things. But for us, if we hadn't built it, it it's not there. So, so you essentially had to go create a fix for the fact that you could not get integrated data. Right, and we and, still don't have one yet. Okay, and Kim, <laughs> you're doing the same thing with your so, medical neighborhood, correct? So we are, so we work very heavily, so on the Mohawk side, right, we work with de-identified data. Mm -hmm. And it is very difficult to get, um, but we, we get um, very specific information, de-identified, but we take action on that and then we send it to the partner and say, are you working with these people? And the conversations that have evolved in the last four years just in, so first of all, it's part reaction time to data, right? Because it's at least 60 days late um, if things work perfectly. And so trying to change that continuum that when you get discharged, you need to call somebody today. Um, it, that, those are just constant conversations and figuring out who can drive that within the partner's organization, I think. You know, there's also, uh, I mentioned uh, telehealth. Um, that's one of the things I think that we enjoy the most at employers like me is being able to put together pilot programs to try Testing to one, test two. these uh, ideas. And for instance, uh, Barbara's company was involved in a telehealth pilot that we did that was directed by the Department of Public Health, who we partner with very closely. Uh, also, uh, Emory University was involved with that and one other uh, of our employers in the Valdosta area. And it was really pretty neat because people there at the local level could go in, get uh, a skin cancer screening, and immediately they were talking to one of the world-class dermatologists at Emory University. And they were able to quickly let them know, yes, you need to go see a local dermatologist for that immediately, or no, that, that looks like that's fine, just keep an eye on it. Uh, any comment about that, Barbara? Yeah, that was a great um, project. We had a little, we had, I think it was 42%. There were only 20, 27 people at Langdale were screened, and I think 22 at the uh, other company that participated. Um, but 42% of our folks that were screened were sent on for further testing with a, dermatolo a local dermatologist. And we had worked, we'd, we'd worked out of an arrangement with them where the employees could get in immediately and be seen, and out of that 42%, 35% actually had cancer, a type of skin cancer. And so they were treated immediately. And I asked them if they would have gone to the dermatologist about that spot, and they said no, they, they probably wouldn't have thought about it. They just decided because it was free and it was during work hours and <laughs> they could talk to a doctor, they participate in the, 
in the project. So it was very good. I look forward to other projects with public health. Well, there's a lot of opportunity there to collaborate and work on these issues. You know, one of the things I think that you need to take away also from this discussion is not just the fact that the employers are within their own walls working on these issues. You heard several instances here where they're actually trying to impact the whole health of the community. And in fact, we, uh, we also uh, help staff some local roundtables in the rural areas. Um, and what happens there is typically the discussion goes from sharing challenges that they're having among the employers to very quickly, hey, we're all hiring from the same, you know, unhealthy pool of folks. How can we genuinely, you know, change the culture of health in our community? And many of us are from the fried chicken buffet line, and it's hard. And so there are a lot of challenges that we actually have some interesting and good examples where, you know, well, just think about, just think about this. In many of our rural communities, and even in the Atlanta area, who are the true leaders oftentimes that make things happen? It's the large businesses and the employers and those families that have been there and invested and really have some vision for their area. So it's quite natural that these employers would be the one to lead the charge to improve health care and to improve that culture of health care in their local community. And what we've discovered is they're very willing to do that. They're excited to see that other folks are interested in making that change, and they'll be glad to help. One other quick comment about on-site clinics. Uh, many people get kind of wrapped around the axle and say, oh my God, I gotta have you know, this huge separate building and a huge pharmacy and da 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 da, -da. No, you know, we've cataloged over 70 on-site clinics and businesses around Georgia, and that's not even really touching the Atlanta market. And what we found is they're all shapes, flavors, and sizes, from just a local uh, PA from the local hospital coming over for a couple hours a, a day to, you know, to a full-blown clinic. You go to Kia and you see an ambulance sitting there, you know, it's kind of like, wow. So that's the other extreme. I had a funny story. I was in Savannah talking to a benefits director, and I asked him, he had an on-site clinic, and I said, how long have you had this on-site clinic? And he thought for a minute, and he thought. And, um, and so finally he goes, well, I think, Don, don't hold me to this, but I think it was about 1868. And I went, what? And he goes, yeah, we owned our little, own little island off the coast of Savannah, and we had a family doctor that was right there. He lived right there, right next to you, right next to the mill, right next to the facility. And when anybody was sick, we went to see that family doctor. And so I thought, my gosh, you know, here we are kind of coming back around to what we knew worked a long time ago. So if they could turn the lights down just a little bit, I would love to have some questions that we could ask the panel here. Any comments or questions? Yes, sir. And they'll bring a mic to you, I hope, so we can all hear it. Yeah, thanks. It's very intriguing. I know data, it seems like healthcare has got lots of data, but very little actionable data. It's kind of sad. You mentioned actually, I think Barbara, talking about finding out that patients were not taking their medicine for diabetes, but that wouldn't be on like one of the coded claims that you would get out of an insurance company. So how did y'all get that data? And did you have any problems with HIPAA and getting your employees having to sign a bunch of permission in order to get sort of that level of data? Well, our TPA... We're one, two, three. Wonderful. From beginning to the end, we're HIPAA compliant. Um, and so we have access to the data. I manage that company. And so we've also got our pharmacy. And it, it wasn't difficult to drill down with the pharmacy and determine that people weren't refilling. Okay, so you got from the refilling, you went from the doctor's orders, which you had because you ran the clinic, right? Well, they had a fill. Yeah. Okay. They had a diagnosis. Okay. So if they had an initial fill and they had a diagnosis of diabetes and then they didn't have any other fills, we put them on the list. Gotcha. If they came back later and said, look, I'm managing it through um, how I eat and I really don't need to be in the program, then we verified that and if they didn't want to participate, it was an opt-out program. Everyone was put into the program and they could opt out. But we had a couple that said they were managing it via how they ate and diet, 
and so they opted out. But we have access to all of our data because we are HIPAA compliant. Okay, thanks. I think we had another one right here. Let me preface this with saying that I am a pharmacist amongst my other things that I do. And I have uh, been involved in MTM. It's called Medication Therapy Management, and that's really actually what you're talking about. And I've advocated for that a long time because it does increase patient outcomes and decrease costs, even though your pharmacy spend may go up. Uh, I, I really commend you for what you're doing. Uh, one of the things that I have seen, uh, actually, I've, I've got two questions. One of the things I've seen is the concern for patient privacy and that they are very willing to talk about even very private matters, but they're not big on this going back to the insurance company. And I wanted to really hone down on this patient privacy. And as you are getting all of this data, how are you protecting that? You may have a lot of diabetic patients or COPD or CHF, but there may be only a handful that have MS that are cancer that of a particular type that are going to be identifiable. I want to see how you're protecting that. Um, how are you dealing with prescriptions for the unmentionables? That they may want to go to a self-pay physician and self-pay, but those are the drugs that are going to cause the interactions. I have seen in practice adult ADD, sexually transmitted disease, uh, the alcoholic that goes on an abuse, they do not want that shared. So that's one. The other one is that is a big problem that I've seen is on hospital discharges. And you've got a problem with readmissions within that 30 day period. And what I have seen is that there is too great a continuous refill by the pharmacy and there's no stop order on those drugs. So what you get from your hospital discharge is not consistent with what they're already getting. How are you dealing with that? I can comment a little bit on those because they're very close to my heart. I'll start with the last one because I can remember the last thing you said, but uh, I made a note on the other. So um, hospital follow-up. In Carrollton, we have one hospital system, so it's not hard. You know, you're either there or you're not. But our on-site pharmacy, and let me maybe say this first, the medical center and pharmacy, while it is on our property and we do see employees and their dependents, we have no access to that information individually. We've been there for over 20 years. I have a feeling if we'd have done it poorly, nobody would be going there. We do it to the point where our phone system, we don't even use the same server as ours. We do not want there to be any question that as a company, we know this information. We even went so far as to how we set up access. We originally were going to have it built where you come through one doorway and you can go here for fitness and here for this. And we said, no, no, no. Some people, we were doing GED at that particular time many years ago. So nobody wanted to tell everybody they didn't have a diploma. So we created independent entrances that um, are very unique. We have our pharmacist, I have a full-time pharmacist um, at the clinic it's owned by Walgreens at this time, that all of her job is following up with patients and meeting with patients. We actually have a room off of our lobby where she meets with all of them. Our adherence rates are much, much higher than the state of Georgia as a rule. It's not rocket science. It's just trust and compassion and understanding what's going on. We also do bedside fills. If you're in the hospital, and you need medication, our pharmacists will stop what they're doing, get in their car, and ride to where you are and make sure that you get the medications. But um, I, I do think privacy is a big deal. I personally would not like all of my stuff, <laughs> whatever that is, getting everywhere. Um, but, but you would be surprised how many employees walk in my office and just tell me everything. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my. <laughs> More than you ever wanted when to know. When did you ever wanted to know? <laughs> the reason they have to do that is because nobody else is listening. There isn't any other way. But I do think pharmacists are an underutilized. They are doctors. Oh, yeah. Counting pills is not 
so, what their expertise should be. So one of our key partnerships that we've developed this last year has been with, uh, with the uh, uh, Georgia Pharmacy Association and a group of independent pharmacists. We've got a question over here, Senator Kirkpatrick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to congratulate you all on uh, what you're doing, the hard work that you're doing. And uh, I'm a physician, so I know that we're all trying to get on the bandwagon of being proactive and treating people on the front end rather than waiting until they get sick. We're trying to do some of that at the state level, too. But behavior change is really hard, and uh, I'd be very interested in whether you feel like you're actually getting your employees engaged enough to move the needle and whether you're seeing the results in your biometrics or if you have been doing this long enough to uh, see any results. Sure, I'll start on that one. Um, so we do measure um, biometrics every two years. So when uh, our, our, our data for 14 is um, not as robust as 16, so we're gonna do biometrics February through April in 18. So we've already built in <laughs> the comparison tool to say where were we in 16, where are we in 18. And then from a risk score perspective, which is how Mohawk, even though risk score doesn't seem to, the whole population health theme seems to be on a downswing, we um, really think that's the ticket for us. So when we look at population risk score, from a retrospective and prospective, we can tell that people who are using our clinics are marginally better than those people that aren't using them in the same area. So that's based on the last, I think, 18 months. So we're going to continue to drive that, anticipating that we can not only continue to make that inroad, but that as we deploy our care teams and, and offer that same kind of support, we're going to be able to do it in other pockets in the country, from our perspective. I, I know for, for us, the one thing I'll tell you, and let me give you a good example. We have an employee, her name is Sarah. She has diabetes and she's obese. So just hearing that, your first reaction is, we well, need to eat better, you need to exercise. Well, what if I told you she's working two jobs and that her neighbors are having to keep her three children because she's a single parent? Then you start looking at this a little different. Then you've got to start looking at well-being as a whole. And that's something we're trying to do at Southwire to better understand what are the underlying reasons for behaviors and what's happening to our community, to our members, uh, and, and to our employees. And that is a can of worms. That yeah. is everything from education to uh, socioeconomic. Uh, we have a pension plan. People don't contribute. Nobody's saving. All those horror stories. But you know what? Yeah, you have to start somewhere, and nobody else is going to be able to do it. So I think that's another good point. So we just brought in behavioral health into our on-site clinic. So we've always had the traditional EAP, but um, people are comfortable going into the clinics. And so we're banking on that, that access right there. You know, the, the coach that you trust, the uh, mid-level that you trust can walk you down the hall and say, here, I want you to meet Barbara. She's not so scary, right? And so maybe you guys could just visit for a minute and then figure out how to evolve that. And I think we also have, Mohawk was never really a fan of promoting the success stories because it was too um, anecdotal, right? We're a manufacturing company, so you measure everything. Um, and so, but we've had so many of these success stories where they had their aha moment as a patient that um, they talk about it, right? They share it over their lunchroom break. Um, the whole notion of biometrics, certainly we were probably no different. Everybody was like, ugh, really? You don't need to get anything about me. I don't want you to know. But over now our, our fourth episode coming up, people are like, okay, we're ready. I need to know what my numbers are. So it really has um, helped, and we will continue to measure that. Sorry. And we've seen the same thing with our biometrics. We've seen a decrease in chronic disease, and I think a lot of it has to do with our, our health advocate that meets with the employees and also helps them navigate the health system. In addition to that, TLC Benefit Solutions is our TPA, and there are a lot of our employees that use the folks over there as a resource as well as far as navigating. Many of them bring their bills over and sit down with one of the ladies there, and they go through, and she explains what the EOB is and what you're supposed to pay, don't pay any more than this. 
And a lot of times they'll call if they have to have an MRI and they'll say, okay, I have to have an MRI. Where's the least expensive place to go get the MRI? Yep. Where do I need to go? Because we've, we've done some direct contracting for imaging. Oh. I wish I had a wonderful story to tell you. Our biometrics are so much better, but they're not. <laughs> but what I'll tell you is that um, not getting worse is improvement. Yeah. And my CEO <laughs> hates it when I said that before. Because it's, it's all like, you got to get better, and they're competitive, and we got to be the best. And keeping well people well. Yes. Huge and impact. as we age, doing nothing <clears throat> gets you behind, as the gentleman said earlier. <laughs> doing nothing is not optional. So, anyway. So, so back, uh, back here, having a, a, a <coughs> great insurance plan is great and all that stuff, but what are practical things that are you doing to communicate that to your employees? Because we have different generations, we have baby boomers, we have Gen Xers, millennials. What are, what are you doing to communicate that? Because it, that's, that's key. You might have the best plan out there, right. but if people mm -hmm. don't know. It would be a secret. Kim, you had the slide, actually, that showed yours by generation, right? Your right. Mm -hmm. staff, so. Um, so we probably do what right. you guys do, too, is um, we communicate in every channel we can get, um, which was not historically our MO, right? We sent you something at home. Um, now we text you. We call you. We use videos. Um, Mohawk is an intranet site. Um, we send, we're very big fans of postcards. Um, because it forces us to be concise in our message and we make them really bright and colorful. So maybe on the way to the trash can, you might, you know, give it a gander. Um, so we communicate in all those different methods and we communicate to spouses. And it's constant communication. Constant. Constant. And, and I think the thing to remember is people will not take time in their limited range of capacity until they need to know it. That's right. You're not going to get a conversation. I can come and teach you everything I know about healthcare, and it will mean nothing. Because if nothing ever happens in those things, it, it won't be relevant. But what I will tell you is that we're approaching it maybe from a different standpoint. We're looking at megatrends, and I don't know how much you guys probably are better at it than I am as far as the retirement rate and the replacement workforce that we're dealing with. And being a manufacturer, nobody wants to be in manufacturing. Parents aren't getting their children to do that. So what we're having to do is we've got a, there's gonna be a big gap of workers and our ability to do what we're doing. There's also a change in relationship to a lot of our wire and cable products probably won't be here in 10 years. So we gotta hire our workforce and train them to be something more than who they are. So we look at something called the employee experience, and that's the way we're looking at it. From the moment you hear about us to the moment you retire, how do we interact with you? And again, it's that well-being. And our hope is that it's gonna retain you, it's gonna help us get the good, good folks in the right place. You don't always make wire and cable in the hot spots of you know, Hallsville, Kentucky, and Flora, Illinois. I doubt some of you have ever been there, but, um, you can't just look at it in an isolation. You can't just communicate to someone. It's got to be Saram Sam. You got to do it all. Talking about your career. Whenever you're talking to me about anything, I can throw in something that relates to that. So. Yeah. Any other questions here? Yes, sir. Yeah, over here on the side. I've uh, had the fortune of visiting all three of your facilities and uh, have, have found them very impressive. Uh, I. I I appreciate what you're doing with physical health. Does this transfer over to mental health as well? Does it transfer? I'm sorry. Mental Do you, health. Are you incorporating mental health? What we're noticing in Georgia, we're having an issue with Right. It. <clears throat> as are we, because when we look at our chronic conditions, de-identified, right, um, like 98% of them are also depressed. Yes. Right. So um, no wonder if you have diabetes, COPD, um, you have a BMI of 40, yeah, you're not doing very well. Mm -hmm. um, so, as I said, we've always had the traditional EAP, but we've recognized in the last two years that's not enough. So we're bringing in, um, they've actually started at our on-site clinic, and so we want to use telehealth. We've actually, Mohawk has bought 10 kiosks with a telehealth partner. We're deploying them in different locations, and so we want to be able to provide not only on-site, um, because once we can get some stickiness, it really does grow. And then from the telehealth perspective, just provides broader access. And if we can connect 
the person in Muskogee with our mental health provider, potentially either in Oklahoma or get them licensed to be in Georgia so they can multi-state um, take care of these people, then that's what we want to see happen. So, you know, one of the, tr we kind of track the trends or, you know, what's the t top discussions that we're having among this group now. And one of those is behavioral health. Mm -hmm. You know, how it just seems like it's kind of evaporated, especially from the rural communities. I saw a slide the other day that showed the number of psychiatrists in the state of Georgia, and it was like Atlanta, you know, and maybe a few others. And, and there's just, you know, complete desert everywhere else. And so how, you know, how do we help these people? Um, we've done another pilot in Coffee County working with the kind of famous Institute for Healthcare Improvement out of Cambridge and working with obese women. The, the four employers involved there, 68% of the female workforce was clinically obese, a BMI of over 30. And guess what? Surprise, surprise, most of them had one, two, three other chronic conditions. And the first pilot group we put through, five of the people were nurses and health clinicians. And so, you know, it dawned on us, my gosh, these people know what to do, but through different social determinants, behavioral issues, they needed help. They couldn't get it done. And it turned out it wasn't, you know, the physical therapist there doing, making them do jumping jacks that helped. It was just being there listening to the folks. And so, you know, that, that, that's something that we really need to think about as policymakers. You know, we've got a group of people that are not only physically ill, but many of them have, you know, mental issues that we need help with. And I see another, yes, sir. Um, excellent panel. The state of Georgia has consistently now over the last, since I've been following it, uh, is ranked in the lowest quintile by the United Health Foundation in terms of health outcomes. And what we see here are three excellent examples of leading employers that have done a really good job of managing outcomes and costs in combination, managing, measuring and managing. You've, you've done, to varying degrees, you've done this. The question I'd like to ask is, have you thought about ways of projecting your success stories, not only just to other employers, but to other stakeholders in the system with respect to the fact that you have improved your role, how you are performing your role as purchasers, and the lessons to be learned from that that are transferable or, or that are meaningful to other stakeholder groups in the system, like, for example, providers. So the question I'm asking you is, you know, given particularly your interest in the health of a larger community, have you taken, have you thought about how you can project your success stories more broadly? I think one of the key things that we have done the last couple of years as we have engaged with the Georgia Hospital Association now, frankly, in some, I can take you to communities in Georgia where the employer, the major employer in the community, will not go to that local hospital. Won't have anything to do with them, won't, won't talk to the board, won't talk to anybody. Okay? I can also take you to communities in Georgia where the employers are very, very involved with the local health care system. They appreciate it, they're part of it, they help make those decisions. We've got a great example with the Savannah Business Group in Savannah, Georgia. That's a group of business, a business coalition, and they're part of our group, but they have been very engaged with the local healthcare system, and it has improved care and reduced cost for everybody there in the Chatham County area. So there are examples. Too often, though, you know, we're ha we're, employers are put in a negotiating position. You know, they, they go to the local hospital when it's time to, you know, to talk to them about the contracts and stuff. And we've got to create opportunities where they develop a true relationship. You know, some of the stuff that's being done with Healthcare Georgia Foundation, you know, trying to put together community activities where everybody is coming together to look at the health of the community. And we're encouraging employers to take part in that. And, and you really can't, there isn't one stakeholder to blame or to that can improve it. We all have to do it. 
And I would give anything to find a way to partner with the healthcare system so that we can transform it. The clinic that we have is operating in a vacuum. My doctors get paid for outcomes, not volume. But they've got 65% penetration rate. So we have people come in there. They're good providers. But when I sit down with the hospital system, they're, they're operating in a different world. They get paid when people are not well. They get paid for bringing in services that may or may not be increasing the health of the community because it's generating revenue. So I get it. I worked in the healthcare system many, many years ago, not as a clinician. But it, it, it's, it's so hard because we don't understand them and they're not understanding us. And sometimes they do and it's just not feasible economically to do something. So we've come to the end of our time and we'll be around hopefully during lunch and stuff and you can ask further questions and anybody who's interested in joining our group, um, just let me know. We'd love to have you involved in the discussion. But I, I want to I wanna leave you a little challenge this morning, okay? You know, what's that commercial? I forgot, I forgot the company, but you know, yes you can. By gosh, yes you can. You know, that, that's the attitude that these folks are having and they're going out and they're making a difference. And don't forget, a difference in one person's life that's on the employee line, it really is a generational change that you're making. You know, some of the folks that we've dealt with in a pilot in Coffee County again, they said, you know what, from what we've learned, we're not bringing that stuff into our home anymore. And so that woman is immediately having an impact on her husband, her kids, and her grandkids. So, you know, never underestimate just the change that we can have with one person, the impact. So yes, we can make a difference. And as state policy leaders, why not gain, you know, bang your gavel, okay? And say, by gosh, Georgia is gonna be a healthy state. We're gonna, we're gonna just put that out there. We're going to improve the health of the state of Georgia. We're gonna have a big, hairy, audacious goal to make that happen. And then I think we would all be surprised how everybody from their own perspective will fall in line and try to help with that. But you know, I don't, I don't sense that. You know, we're a state that's open, we're, we're an economic development state. We're open for business, well guess what? Healthcare is going to kill business, and it's going to stop recruitment. It's going to stop expansion. So I would hope, as a state leader, that you pick up the mantle of creating a healthy Georgia. Thank you for your time. Thank you all. Let me echo Don. I mean, I think this is inspiring because, again, in, in difficult circumstances, they show that this can be done. And I remember Sonny Perdue, when he was governor, he put together an employer group, and I think Barbara was on that group. He was doing it, yes, to make us a healthier state, but his purpose was an economic competitiveness issue, exactly what he said. He said, in many parts of our state, health care costs are among the highest in the country. You're not going to attract businesses to that part of the state with, if that continues to be the case, and it still is. So let me summarize a little bit some themes that we're going to talk about in our next panel. They invested in primary care. This is the best return on investment that you can make. They have flexibility. There's a saying in, in rural health care, you know, if you've seen one community, you've seen one community. They're all doing a little bit different things to fit their community. They need the flexibility to do that and data. We've got to have access to our data and analyze it. Think we're, we lead the nation in health IT. You know, we can do that. We can be the leader in the country. And so we're going to talk about that in the next panel. We're going to take a five-minute break, and we'll be back in a few minutes.